So, where do you start after that? Um, I suppose congratulations, first of all, because um, what I'd like to say on behalf of uh, Aspect of Living here for a remarkably uh, powerful, uh, thought provoking, and even beautifully understated film, which I think is very important. I hope people agree with me on that. Yeah. Just reintroduce obviously Colin needs needs some introduction. Sandra Lee from Wave and, and Brendan who uh, made the film, Brendan Byrne. Um, and well, thank, thank you for, for sitting up here. We've got about 20 minutes or thereabouts. Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna share what you said to me as, as we sat in the back row together. And we've, we've known each other no, no, we've known each other a long time, and um, you just turned to me and said, I guess me every time. Um, and I just wonder how you feel, uh, you've obviously seen it before and been such part of the process, but to sit in the gallery premiere with a public audience for the first time uh, and to experience that, because there's, there's always a feeling in, in a gallery like this, uh, it clearly just, just catches you every time. Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I've got to think back, you know, I spent uh, a year to 18 months making the work in 2014 and uh, through 2015 um, collaborating with Wave and with, with, with the illustrious new, new stadium and um, you know you become I talk about the, the horror of the stories which I've heard and I talk about the fact that nothing can prepare you for that we at the time got new sound bites. Um, sometimes what we the last time used it in, in the, the evening news. And um, what, what we didn't get was what the horror of that entailed. And many of the people who I painted and spoke to, there was never an opportunity to express that whenever I was there. So I put the energy of that, I suppose, back into the work and I talk about it. Tended to weave that into the film itself. Um, I suppose that was my release. Um, and I suppose whenever I spoke to you at the back end and said that, I, you know, it came from a place where it's not that I'm used with the work of the work, because I've never been used with the work, I never tire of it. But some of the emotive power through time. Has left for me, I suppose, because the emotive power was in the making of the work. For for me, it's not in the viewing of all of all of it. But so whenever I go to the exhibition, um, I see eighteen minutes of cloth of paint put onto them. But when I see the film, I see it all again, and I see it in a completely fresh way. Um, I genuinely. Invented, and I've seen the film a few times now, and it does genuinely get me every time. And that is down to simply the sensitivity that Brendan brought to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he kind of got what the spirit of the exhibition was about and ran with it in his own way. And although we collaborated quite a lot, you know, the credit for the film has to be his. I'm going to talk to Brendan and ask Sandra about that. I just want to do that. Just before we do that, just to, I, I want to just tease out, in case people haven't seen the exhibition, although many of us will have, um, and read the, uh, the, the, the uh, catalogue that went with it. You were a number of years ago, and again, many people will know this, but working on a series of large heads, and they were large heads of mostly very well known individuals, writers, actors, musicians. Um, not that state of politics, but the politicians came later. Um, and there was, an, there was an issue for you about, about capturing the on faces about celebrity, particularly interested in the cultural world on the island of Ireland. Um, and you then, what, explain, you, you began to see past, as you were doing things, you began to see past the celebrity, and you began to see the individual, the humanity. Um, and when they came into your studio, they stopped being well known faces and they became. Sitters, is that what happened? Yeah, I mean, we talk, you yeah. and I talked about this, that, um, you know, I mean, whenever I painted people like Brad Pitt, 
it, um, it, it ceases to be a film star. He, he ceases to be a film star when he's there. Whenever I painted at him, he was just off a transatlantic flight from the Toronto Film Festival, I think, and was wrecked. And he, um, you know, so you're seeing the Hugh, Hugh Newman there. I think that was the key to it. Celebrity doesn't interest me at all, but human beings behind whatever facade or mask society puts onto them or that they might put on themselves, that's at the heart of it. And I think um, whenever I talk about the 18 degrees, do the silent testing, in some ways it's an extension of the other work which I've done as well. I didn't treat the paintings any differently particularly. And the process was the same. And that was that, and, and this is the antithesis of what, cla what classical portraiture is about, where classical portraiture is about allowing the viewer to engage with the person that they're seeing. My aim is to actually nearly disengage to the point where I'm painting a particular mode of the time where the sitter seeing me on the way and being there, where they're on their own, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and two things, and I'm trying to be spirited because I'm mindful of the time. How did you go from painting that series of paintings to Seven and Testimony? Because that was a change. And the, the sitters were different. And secondly, apart from being that, how did you then agree that Brandon was the person you would trust to make the film? Okay. Yeah, well, um, it was a gradual step. Going back to 1998, I can send it in film. Good, good Friday agreement at the time. Good news for most of us who were simply tired of what was going on here. Um, but save for a few lines, there was nothing in it for people who suffered loss. And I suppose as time went on, we all hoped that that would be addressed. And um, I suppose I, in myself, just quietly was aware of the fact that this massive section of our community was, in a sense, paying for everybody else's peace. This was a massive section of our community who, um, and the Victims Commission actually put it out as many as one in three who live here now. In this massive section of our community that is uh, many people in it are incapable of a mood that they're on. And um, you know, the answers, the justice which they so dearly required, um, with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, they had to for forego that for a greater good. And what I was intending to do. So whenever I started making the large scale head paintings, I realised as an artist, I may have found a way to express that. I talked to Alan McBride and Sandra Pink uh, from Wave at the start. This was 2014. This is going to be 2013, 2014. And I said, I have a simple idea to make paintings of people who suffered loss. Um, is it a popularizing idea? Is it an unhelpful idea? And they both said no. And in fact, they encouraged me to do it. And I then asked them, would, would you help me? Would you partner me in this? And Sandra and her team at Wave um, came up over a period of weeks, possibly months, a very, very carefully curated list of 18 to make sure that the balance was as correct as it was possible to be. And um, Sandra and we have become great friends in the process. And um, you know, as I say, part of me and going through, through that. And were advocates for me doing it as well. The, it wasn't really choosing Brendan as such. Um, Brent, Brendan came to me. He'd seen the work. And um, he said basically he wanted to make a film based on the paintings. And I mean, Brenton, you'd agree, I, I was apprehensive at the start. You came to my For sure. <laughs> yeah, I said, uh, my point was that I wasn't protective of the paintings particularly. You know, the paintings are out there doing their own thing. I was protective of the 18 people who sat before me. And 
and um, the kind of spirit that I had created and what the exhibition was about. Um, but, but to be fair, on Brandon, he, he spent a long time just listening and taking that in. And then he came back and said, I, I, we're happy to make the film in a way that the people who sat for you waited and you were content with. Mm -hmm. Um, Brendan, I think <coughs> I have no doubt that there must have been other filmmakers who wanted to have a shot at what you did. Um, we would need to talk about that. The point is that you successfully talked to Colin and Colin agreed. How did you how did you know that that would work? How did you know, how could you see the potential in 18 paintings to make such a, a, a moving uh, and appropriate, perfect, Documentary, really, because it works on so many different levels. And in other hands, uh, I again know it could be a very mediocre film. Well, uh, thank you, firstly, uh, and, and secondly, how the film ended up came out of partly the conversations that Colin and I did have. Because my initial idea was it was actually started out with a disappointment because when I went to see the exhibition, 2015 and thought it was amazing. I felt as if I missed an opportunity because the kind of standard way of doing such a thing would be to have known about it beforehand, to have followed the process, notwithstanding that, you know, as such we found out that Colin wouldn't let you break that glass curtain between him and the sitter. But, you know, you'd follow the process of Colin painting the sitters and then it would all end up in the exhibition. So that's what. I was kind of disappointed when I went to see the exhibition for myself. I was delighted for Colin and the paintings and I fell in love with them. But it stayed with me and it stayed with me for, for quite some time. And, and it was a year and I spoke to my colleague here, Trevor Bernie here, and I said, look, can I get these paintings out of my head? Uh, I'm going to do something about them. Uh, and I didn't really quite know exactly what I was going to do. And I went to see Colin and we talked about it and he expressed that some of his you know, apprehensiveness about how it would translate from a, an art exhibition into a film. And it was something he said uh, as part of that first meeting, which then unlocked it again for me, which was he, he, he was saying, look, what happened to these people and maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, but this story is in the now. I mean, if you go and meet these people, you will see the lines of pain that I painted in their face and the agony and the grief that they have suffered is as relevant and as alive today as it was when this happened to them. So then I realised actually it was the paintings themselves uh, in a filmic cinematic sense that would be the real heart and core of the film and that that was the visual thread. It's not about the process of the painting uh, at all, it's about the paintings themselves and how then the paintings could become the window into these people's stories and their souls. And then, unlike Colin, because I feel sorry for artists sometimes in that they're, it's a lonely, it's a lonely room, an artist makes his paints alone. Uh, whereas a filmmaker has the good fortune of having other hugely creative people to collaborate with. And in my case, I had my old friend and uh, uh, colleague, Greg Darby, who edited the film. I went to one of the best cinematographers in Ireland, uh, to shoot the film, and I got a, a surname name sake to do the music. So for me then, when I realized about the nouness of it, it was really about trying to find a cinematic way of, in some ways, making the experience of the film uh, intense and visceral and, and raw, which is why I chose the short format, but uh, by, to try and even touch somehow what it must be like, uh, for that grief and that intensity of the grief to try and get the film uh, uh, to try and sort of thematically kind of at least parallel some of those things. So it was the combination of my team from the producers and the editors and the, the, the composers uh, with a, a little bit of you know, stuff thrown in there which, 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 which find a way to, to tell the story and do it justice. And Simon, for you, whenever Colin first approached you about the film and about it, uh, painting, some people who have been affected so badly by the troubles of approached yourself and Alan. Uppermost in your mind must have been that you wanted to ensure those individuals would in any way be exploited. 
was that your first concern? Well, it was, and I think looking at you know the, what contribution would it make? Would it be helpful to individuals? Would it be helpful to our society? Would it be helpful to other victims and survivors? I think common mention is a very important word in, in the film, which is acknowledgement. And I think that over time, people really have a sense that there has not been acknowledgement here uh, for um, the pain and suffering that they've endured. Uh, when Colin came, Colin's very gracious because Colin doesn't tell you that when he came to me, he said, Well, I'm thinking maybe around, maybe I, you know, how did you feel about 10 paintings? Uh, and in true way of style, he said, Yeah, you know, you, you can look at that. And um, now Tresor Kagan and Ali Bryan and I sat down and we developed this matrix of looking at really, you know, the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, looking at you know, cross and Catholic other, looking at male, female, looking at who did what to whom, uh, looking at, you know, Northern Ireland, the six counties, looking at Ireland, looking at um, how the troubles had also uh, impacted England and other areas. And we came back to him and said, Colin, we think that uh, you can't do this with any less than your team. <laughs> uh, and uh, Colin was very good. He said, oh, you could deal with and said, yeah, well, I think the 18. And the 18 were right. I mean, I think when you go to the gallery and you see the 18, we talked about this, and um, and some people knew who Colin was, but some people didn't, and they went into it with a really open heart, and, and, and were very trusting and, and worked with them, and viewed Colin now as a true friend because he he didn't exploit them, he worked with them, he explained what he was doing, uh, and they journeyed together. And and do you now think on mature reflection, you've got the exhibition, you've seen the success that it has been, you've now seen. The film uh, in its finished uh, stage, and you've seen an audience reaction to it. Um, did it achieve what you also wanted to achieve? That it would it would further the debate, further the conversation, help some of those who were so badly affected by the troubles, not just the eighteen who were painted, but others to perhaps have their well voices heard. Here, my voice is what the film is called. Has it done that? I think it has, and I think that that Thomas O'Brien, who was here, said a true thing. He said. They have gone, but we are their voice. And I think that all of the sitters gave voice to their loss, but they also gave vo lo their voice to the thousands of other people out within our, our community. I mean, Colin, when he came, we could have given him um, 10 people easily, and he said he wanted people who, by and large, were living silently within our community. And the reality is that the sitters represent many people who live silently within our communities, who work alongside us, um, who may sit beside us, um, and a variety of things uh, who may be relatives and for whom the, the, the story is not told and I think that the exhibition has given a voice to to the sitters but it's given a voice to many 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 more people than that and I think the film um, complements that so well and I suppose to Brendan I want to say thank you I know that it was a tall order um, to um, really to do justice to to the work uh, Andrew Tully was fabulous with the families uh, and was very supportive to them um, and um, you know I think that it, it has been hugely important and I think it's hugely important when we look at the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement I mean when we look at really what victims and survivors were asked to do and how the years um, have been since and also in the absence of a process to deal with the legacy of that has. I'm happy to take a few quick questions from the board. I'm just going to have one very quick answer and I, I just think it's very relevant. It's just come to my mind. My daughter was having her 21st birthday party at the weekend and she's at university in England. She had a bunch of kids from university there over here in Belfast for a very long and <laughs> exhausting weekend. I went to see the exhibition on Friday and those kids have absolutely no connection, most of them with Northern Ireland, haven't been here before, knew nothing about the troubles, came for our 21st birthday party, they went to the exhibition, they talked about little else all weekend, and I'm serious in saying that, they, want, they were, apart from being blown away by Collins, still as a painter, but they were captivated by the stories, and they wanted to talk about the troubles and people's experiences, and it was just really, really interesting to see a bunch of 20 and 21 year olds not from this place, be so moved by something and have such a mature reaction. So my experience, Sandra, is that if that was your state of the end, it was a huge success because that's exactly the impact it had on those young people over the weekend. Uh, and I was glad to have those conversations on occasions because um, it was better than uh, 
21st celebrations that were uh, relevant. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, I think it was very, very good from that point of view. And it's great that it's back on in the Ulster Museum. So, look, uh, happy to take a few thoughts because there's so much we could talk about, and I'm so sure so much that you would like to hear from people. But I hope you think that at least they've given you some of the context for the exhibition and the film. Um, I am going to rely on somebody's mic. Was there some hands? So I can't see who's who, but if you want to identify yourself, please do. And could I just ask that if you do want to ask a question, it's a sort of a short, snappy, direct question. We'll try and get a short, snappy, direct answers. Um, so hi, I'm Shauna. Um, what struck me most about the film was the absence of labels, um, which is to be commended, of course, but how important was that for you? Yep. Absence of that in the film and also in the exhibition, uh, in terms of identifying people. Do you want a quick word? Well, yes, but it goes back to the foundation yeah. of, of, of the exhibition and that came about in the first place. Uh, and when Colin approached Zandra, uh, and how he wanted to, 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 to paint the faces of loss, and it was, it was Sandra and Wave who uh, obviously, in order to make sure that this was something that couldn't be easily politicised in a negative way, where it went to painstaking lengths to represent people from all religions, all uh, creeds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in many ways, in terms of the film, I, I was, I came into the process. It was up to the film, but always have to respect the integrity of the original endeavor and the art exhibition to begin with. Otherwise, it would never have worked, and it would never have been complimentary. But it is planned out to be such the right thing in the first place because you know it's it's not something that anybody can talk about about oh there's too much of this there's too much of that because it's really what it's looking at is is the universality of, of human loss and in fact you know the film's dedicated to all those who have suffered loss and conflict that's not just here that's all around the world so you know the the, the lack of labels is, is vital in terms of an appreciation uh, and a sympathetic view of films such as this Okay, in a sense, that basically you took that decision that the panels that you put in the initial exhibition would not identify the nature of some of those or label them to any particular religion, any particular background. That's correct. I mean, you make a very good point there. I think that um, yeah, um, Brennan is correct. It's human loss, and that's why I wanted to strip everything down to. But what, what I will say is an interesting byproduct of the whole thing, which didn't occur to me until I spoke to a few people who went to see the exhibition in 2015. They came out and they said to me, not only was it striking that they didn't know who were the Protestants and Catholics or who were affected by the acts of Republican and Loyalist or state, but they questioned themselves by saying, why did I, why did I even need to know what to start off with? Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. This is gentleman just there. there. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patrick. Um, first of all, thank you for the, the exhibition, for the film. I'm very well involved in it. Uh, I saw it a couple of years ago at the museum. I just saw it again this afternoon, the, the exhibition. It's so heartbreaking, so moving, and, and so relevant of a school that spirit of never again that we're, we're thinking about particularly this week. What happens after, what happens to the exhibition after it leaves the museum again later this month? Because it feels to me like it needs a permanent place where people can see it over and over again, or for the first time in years to come, uh, as a reminder that we can never go back. Patrick, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a plan? Yeah, well, um, yes, there absolutely is a plan to tour this. In fact, it has been to France, it's been to Dublin Castle, it's back at the Austrian Museum until the 22nd of this month, Daily, um, July through September, talking to a couple of people, there are a couple of places in the States too. But, you know, you're not the only person to say that it could be per per reveal here. That that to an extent is out of my hands. I sort of have made the work and it's out there now and um I I would uh, if people feel that it would be of use or it would be helpful or it could help them deal with what they have to deal with them. I think those are things that need to be prepared. Yeah. 
point well made, made, of course. There is <coughs> some <coughs> some towards the back. Um, yeah, congratulations to your audience, certainly it's a fantastically moving piece of work. I was interested in the fact that um, the people's faces, the scale of them and the way the camera moved in them, they became like landscapes, were surrounded by landscapes, and almost uh, they were like Mount Rushmore's of, uh, of grief or, or sorrow and loss, and I thought it was a very special thing. So I wanted to ask both Colin and, and Brendan about the scale of the paintings and how important that was, uh, as well as the personal testimony that went with them. Well, start? Yeah, yeah, sure. From my point of view, um, I started looking at the large scale test in 2010, and I came to realize that they were working with themes. And although it was never started off as a theme, the large scale heads became that. Um, they were made at the start by accident. Um, I had Duke's uh, show at the studio. I was going to make a him as the very first person I painted. And I just picked the canvas up and it fell right. I was never a fan of the overblown um, large scale head, um, but it just fell right. And you're completely right because what it allowed me to do was bring everything that I had learned about paint to one particular thing. So his dreadlocks were painted like trees, and his skin was painted like the landscape, and his eyes were painted like wind reflections. And I was able to bring it all together in one piece. Every painting that I've done since then has been the same size. You know, my, my painting of the queen, my, my painting of various people um, uh, from here, they're all the same size, and I suppose it's the human kind of a quality that I'm attempting to capture there. Some people criticize me for it because it's predictable, but my point is, if I leave this body of work behind, it shows that I kind of view everybody as a sort of equal. And so silent testimony, each of the individuals were as important, if not more important, than many of the people who had been able to achieve great things in everybody else's eyes. How much does this get important uh, as, a, as a filmmaker for you, Brandon? Well, well it, 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 it's very, very important in terms of being able to, to, to sustain a film uh, so that you know you have enough visual breadth uh, to, to work with across the 18 paintings. Uh, but what was, what was more important was another key that uh, Colin and I connected with uh, was that we made a bold decision at the beginning that while I was going to interview the sitters, I wasn't actually going to film the interviews because I didn't want the, the filmed interview to uh, compete or contrast with the pain in the face. Uh, and similarly then, my, the, the, the gentleman uh, who, who, who shot the material in the Riddles Warehouse studio, we had already filmed some additional material with the sitters uh, some of the shots that appear at the end of the film, but he was continually at me saying, you know what, uh, that's kind of too TV, let's not do that, let's put everything into this workhouse scene. And Colin and I had spoke about the limitations of staging an art exhibition for filming purposes in a traditional gallery setting, because there have to be on a wall, and the camera can't glide out from behind them or glide in towards them. You can't bring very expensive, cool filming equipment into galleries. So Colin had known about Riddle's Warehouse. I had filmed in it as well. And we knew that it was the perfect art gallery, but also it was the kind of place that felt like the it was a, it, it almost has a ghost-like present that, that in the paintings on their own within that setting would feel like the ghosts of people lost within the film. So once we had that location, and decided to run with that. Then that was my top as a filmmaker <coughs> to, to bring everything in. And then that allowed the paintings to become, uh, as Peter said, the kind of Mount Rushmore's of the film. So it was, it was a two-pronged process, uh, which Colin himself was also involved in. Okay, I think we've got a mindful of the time here. <coughs> well, it is Quentin, isn't it? Yeah, Quentin just towards the front. Uh, you've done the warehouse bit brilliantly. Uh, tell us a bit about the music, which is fantastic. Well, uh, thanks for asking that lovely, lovely story. Uh, I, I have a, a composer who I normally work with uh, a lot, uh, who's a, 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 a good French guy. 
but <laughs> uh, from Berman's side. But anyway, what had happened was uh, there's a piece of music that went to an award ceremony a number of years ago, and that section of the award ceremony where they're paying tribute to the people who knew in the industry who have passed on. And uh, I was there with my colleagues and uh, my wife, and there was a beautiful piece of music played by the composer, written by the composer Brian Byrne, but it was performed by the, the, the wonderful Glaswegian violinist Nicola Bende. And it was a piece of music called Lament for the Fallen, which has become my wife's favorite piece of music, which is the composer's piece of music which he wrote for the death of his father. And uh, I fell in love with this piece of music as well. When we were down filming some of the shots in the film in Dublin Castle, uh, Colin was on the radio on the Mary McCallaghan show. And all the same video program was Brian Byrne, the composer of The Met for the Fallen, playing a piece of his own music on the radio program. And I went, happy days, there it is. Colin Davidson, Brian Byrne, Brendan Byrne, perfect match. I wanted a classical score too. My good French guy does piano stuff, and he's kind of out there, you know. So I went, you're in a moment. So phoned up Brian Byrne the week after he'd been in the studio with Colin, said, Colin, uh, Brian, listen, I've got to do this movie, you've got to do it with me. <coughs> what is it about? Colin Davidson, Seven Testimony. I'm in. Bang. So that was it. And uh, he did a brilliant job. And uh, he's also just done the soundtrack to Black 47, which is opening the Belfast Film Festival tomorrow night about the fan. And he's a, a great guy. He lives in LA, but he's from Ireland. So thank you, Brian Bird. It's wonderful and it's very there and memorable, but yeah, it's not obtrusive, which is which is fantastic. Um, just a quick final thought, very quick for me to do, then we need to we need to wrap this up. Although I'm sure you're happy to around and chat to people individually. Um, Sandra, the timing is interesting as well, the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. You said what you hope the exhibition film might achieve, but um, do you have a final a final thought about um, the impact that might have on the lives of the people who were touched by the film and the people uh, whose lives were touched by the, the past here and who feature in the film and those whose lives have been touched by the drugs that don't feature in the film that we share so much um, with so many people in this society by what happened here over 30 or 35 years. I think Colin said it in the film. He said when, when we're gone, the, the film was on, but the portraits live on. And I think that, you know, um, I mean, that's, they're set now in stone um, um, for, forever. And I think that that is, um, or set in, uh, on campus forever. Uh, uh, and I think that that's something which is very powerful. I think for, for many people, they've identified um, with the, the portraits. Uh, her mother walks of life who said that couldn't be me, that could be my mother, that could be my father, my brother, my sister. Uh, and I think that that has given a voice uh, and a sense of comfort to people that it has been uh, recognised. For the sitters, I think uh, it's, it's um, I mean, Mo Norton said earlier, it's very hard when you see yourself, I don't know, are we calling it six foot by four foot? I mean, if you're painted six foot, well, whatever. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's large scale and I think that um, you know, they've been very taken uh, uh, with that. Uh, and I think that it must be very hard to look at yourself in relation to how other people will see you when you talk about your, your loss. Uh, and yet they've trusted the process, and I think that's something which is very important. Uh, and I suppose on behalf of the sitters, and many of them are here, uh, I, I think that they would say that this has been something which has been immensely rewarding, and that uh, Colin has been extremely humble and gracious, and uh, they would want to thank him, thank him from the bottom of their hearts for, for coming uh, and, and for undertaking this work. And uh, it's been something which has been huge. And I think to Brendan, I would want to acknowledge his um, skill and expertise in producing such a heart-rendering film. Colin, you said it, I mean, uh, we've watched it many times. We've watched it over the last uh, few months, and we've watched different versions as the guys have reshaped it, uh, and it never fails to get to. And um, it is extremely touching. Um, well said, Brian. Just a, a, a quick thought on what happens as far as the film is concerned. I, I think BBC Northern Ireland has the rights to, to, to show it, but you also hope, when you take it to film festivals, is that the idea? Yes, so just a quick thing. I started at Peter Johnson next year today, BBC Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland Screen jointly funded it. Uh, so thanks to both of them, they've always supported me, uh, and thank my films and uh, our careers. Uh, the film will go now and be seen at film festivals around the world. 
for the next nine months. And uh, uh, my colleague here, Andrew, is, is, is responsible for looking after all that. We'll go some, we'll not go them all. But, and, and that's one of the beauty of, of film and, uh, is that um, for, it's hard to bring Colin's exhibition everywhere. So where he can't go, we'll bring the film. So it's going around the world, and then next year it'll be on BBC and uh, Northern Ireland, won't be BBC Network. But we're hoping we're in talks right now that uh, in the next six to eight weeks that the film will run here uh, for a week uh, and uh, will be available to watch theatrically in the cinema the, uh, as high as needed. So, so what happens in these situations is you know these things develop, take on a bit of life of their own. This is the pedal of the column being dropped today. Uh, so honored to have George Mitchell introduce the film here today. You know, God knows where this is going to go. God knows what doors this will open. God knows who this film might uh, uh, appeal to. Uh, so the, the journey starts here. Is that, uh, is that pretty much summed up for you as well? Uh, Colin, it's impossible to know quite what happens next. So you've talked about what you'd like to have for the exhibition, but the, the film is now uh, uh, as important a piece of work as, as the exhibition is. The tour. So close to the link, aren't they? Well, that's true. Yeah. I mean, I think that where I think the relationship has actually worked is that it is an extension of the film. It is an extension of what I, what my original idea was, and it doesn't stray from that. And I think that is where the success of it is. I think, um, you know. I also am there for the fact that I think you said it too, you know, that I, I have made 18 new friends too. And um, it's been a great privilege the whole way through. It's been one of the great privileges of my career um, to do this. And, um, you, you know, so I'd like to thank Sam, Sandra, and Alan, and Mara, Therese, and everybody who sat for a wall with me. I'd also thank, like to thank Kim at the museum too, who um, actually agreed to show it before a single painting was made. Um, you know, there was a certain element of trust putting me there. Um, I think the last thing that stays with me, and I think the most important thing, is something that Brian said too, and that is that this isn't about history. This isn't me dragging the bad days into the here and now. It's not about dragging us all back in time. This is about the here and now. And this is about this massive section of our community living in our midst right now. Let's leave it there. Um, very thoughtful stuff, and thank you very much for sharing uh, your experiences and your hopes for uh, the exhibition on the film. Um, on behalf of everybody here, uh, I think it's been a real privilege to, to, to be at this first gala premiere screening. Um, congratulations, and uh, um, the best of good wishes for the future. Thank you very much.